So we are going to try to now put together all of the various facts we've learned about the nervous system into one big whole. We know something about neurons and glial cells. We know something about the general structure of the spinal cord. We've learned a little bit about the brain. So let's see what we can do with this. Marina. Um, there was a nervous system part one lecture. That's what I did last Friday. And there's, we had the spinal cord lecture in there just a moment ago. And now we're on this second part. Okay? So, uh, just a couple of little review things. Remember, we've got, we learned all these different parts of the spinal cord. Um, we also looked at the spinal cord in cross-section and saw various features here as well. How about if we look at this in reality? Let's, let's look at a chunk of somebody's spinal cord. Okay? This is what it would look like in reality. So you can see these, these deep divisions on either side. You can see the spinal nerves coming off the sides over here. If we look at the substance of the spinal cord, I mean, what is it made out of? It's made out of nerve tissue. There's something very, very interesting to note about this nerve tissue here. Notice that some of it has a very dark color to it, and some of it has a very light color to it, right? These central lumps right here have sort of a dark color, and sort of the outside parts of this have a very light color, don't they? Well, people that talk about nerve tissue typically talk then about gray matter and white matter. What you have to realize right off is this is not two different types of tissue. This is one tissue and another tissue. Remember, a tissue is typically made up of a single type of cell. And in this case, we've got cells that extend all the way through this. But the fact that some of the nerve tissue is dark makes it termed gray matter, and other tissue is light, it's termed white matter. So we want to investigate what is this, okay? So if I come back to my basic picture here, I can see gray matter and white matter in my artist's picture here, right? The gray matter is more central, the white matter is more peripheral. Gray matter is kind of formed in what some people think of as like maybe a butterfly sort of thing. It, it obviously extends out the back. Notice it extends right toward the areas where the rootlets of the spinal nerves are. That's interesting. White matter is, is all the way around here. Now here's the details, and this is why gray is gray and white is white, or at least structurally where it comes from. Whenever I see gray matter in the central nervous system, I know that I'm looking at cell bodies and dendrites of various neurons. Cell bodies and dendrites. Now this is a, a very basic picture. There are some exceptions to this. But on the whole, this is what you want to start with as you begin to understand the nervous system. Cell bodies and dendrites make up what we call gray matter. So what's the other part of the neuron that would make up white matter then? Cell bodies, dendrites, and? Come on. Axons, right? White matter are the axons. So the cells themselves extend from gray into white. There's no one cell in the gray or one cell in the white. The cells that we've described, and again, there are minor exceptions to this, but as we're describing it, the axon, I'm sorry, the neuron itself is in both places, isn't it? Part of it is in the gray matter area, and part of it is in the white matter area, right? So when I'm, when I'm looking at gray matter and white matter within nerve tissue, this is what I see. Now let's use a very simple diagram of a couple of neurons to see if we can make sense out of this. Let's just get a couple of neurons here. We're going to just sort of do 
parts of the nervous system in miniature here. I've got two neurons. Can you identify dendrites here? Right? These would be dendrites. Can you identify the cell bodies? Yes, you can. Can you identify the axons? Okay? So, here I've got a neuron stimulating another neuron. Maybe this goes over to a muscle or something. So where would my gray matter be here? Here would be my groups of gray matter. Where would my white matter be? Would be right here. So as a student, as a person trying to learn the nervous system, you want to have sort of this, concept, this conceptual idea of what's going on in gray matter and what's going on in white matter. And right away, I think you begin to see what happens in and around the cell body and the dendrites. What, what's going on within the neuron right here? Processing, decision making, right? This is, this is where the cell is receiving impulses and making decisions and deciding what kind of an impulse to send through the axon to the next location, right? So what are these white matter areas then, right? Just transfer area. These are just the wiring, right? <clears throat> this is where the thinking goes on. White matter, when I see it, is just cabling from one gray matter area to another. That make sense? Is this connecting a little bit? So we're just showing a single neuron, but there would be <clears throat> hundreds, thousands, of neurons in a gray matter area with all of their axons going out some direction somewhere, some way. Why don't we put the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system around this now? Okay, here's the central nervous system. Here's the peripheral nervous system. Almost every cell body in my entire nervous system is where? in the central nervous system, right? This is, this is where axons connect out into the parts of my body, isn't it? So 99% of all the processing that goes on within my nervous system happens within the central nervous system. There are a couple of exceptions. I'm going to give you later in this talk, I'll give you one exception where we do find a little bit of gray matter out in the peripheral nervous system. But you can just sort of think in general terms, 99% of my processing is all within my central nervous system. And within the central nervous system, there are gray matter areas that need to talk to other gray matter areas. So I've got a lot of white matter within my central nervous system, which is the actual cabling or connecting links between various processing areas of my central nervous system. <clears throat> now, why is this white while this is gray? Well, it has to do with the structure of the axons here. The gray matter areas are just raw cytoplasmic, protoplasmic, just basic cellular stuff, which has this gray look to it. But along with axons, there are a whole lot of other cells in these white matter areas. <clears throat> in the central nervous system, the axons are typically covered with ogliodendrocytes. Do you remember what this glial cell does? Is what? It's one of the helper cells, but what does it help with? What does an ogliodendrocyte do? It's what? Insulation. insulation is the key word. Not so much protection, but insulation. It insulates. Okay? Over here, what's the insulator cells in the peripheral nervous system? Remember? Schwann cells, okay? Both of these cells are doing the same thing, just one inside the central nervous system and one in the peripheral nervous system. Well, these insulator cells 
produce a material called myelin. And sometimes this insulation is called the myelin sheath. Myelin is a lipid type substance, it's about 80% lipid, which is fat, right? So these two types of cells are really in a sense kind of like, they aren't adipose cells, but they're like that. They're producing a myelin <coughs> substance, not adipose, which is typical fat, but that material <coughs> is insulating and when I see fat it's typically colored it's pale it's white it's a whitish you've you've seen adipose in the cat right so it's got a whitish cast to it so when you get all these oligodendrocytes mixed in with all these axons the tissue in that area takes on this whitish appearance because of all the insulation. Likewise, all the nerves, the nerves you've seen in a cat's body, all look white, right? Not because the axons are white, but because their insulator cells are all white. So where I have raw protoplasmic tissue, I call this gray matter. When I see white matter, I see axons and their insulation. So I can understand gray matter, white matter. Now I know what's going on there too. When I see gray matter anywhere in the central nervous system, I know some thinking is going on there. Some, one of the activities of the nervous system is taking place in the gray matter areas. Okay, is this, is this big picture sort of coming along now? You see how we can start to put the axons and the neurons, what we see in the tissue. Now the, the cellular, I've made such a simple little cellular picture. The cellular interactions are so complex. That's where we get things like two plus two is four and remembering where my car was parked and, and wondering at the night sky and the vastness of the universe and all those things that I do as a human being are all in the complex interactions of gray matter throughout my brain and, and a little bit my spinal cord. <clears throat> now, as we describe gray matter and white matter areas, you're going to see certain words show up that will key in your mind, oh, I'm looking at some gray matter or some white matter. Let's look at some of these words. For example, you're going to see in the brain the words cortex and nuclei. When you see a something cortex, you know that we're, being, we're talking about gray matter. If you see a something nuclei, you know we're talking about gray matter. Uh, an example of this would be the cerebral cortex. Where would that be? on the cerebrum, and it's right on the surface. We use cortex for the surface. You remember our brain study last week? We just kind of got into that, where you cut in, if we take these models apart, there are places where the tissue is cut, and you can see that little layer of gray matter at the surface of the cerebrum. And most of the thinking that takes place in the cerebrum takes place right on the very surface right next to the cerebrospinal fluid, right next to all the oxygen and nutrients from the blood vessels in the subarachnoid space, right? But there are a few bits of gray matter deep down inside the cerebrum, and we call those nuclei. You'll see, for example, something called the basal nuclei. <clears throat> those are gray matter areas in the central nervous system. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this is brain over here, this is spinal cord, this one over to the right here. And in the spinal cord, that gray matter is referred to as horns of gray matter. There's a posterior horn and an anterior horn. That butterfly shape sort of pushes the gray matter out into these little projections that are called horns here. So this is the terminology that's used for gray matter. Now the white matter in the central nervous system, you'll have gobs and gobs of what appear to be nerves, but they're all kind of 
just bundled and jumbled together into one big area. But the, these bundles of axons that travel are going to be called tracks. So if you see something like a nerve, but it's called a tract, it's within the central nervous system. In other words, it's within the brain or within the spinal cord. Those same axons out here in the peripheral nervous system have another name, though. What do we call bundles of axons in the peripheral nervous system? It's so easy that you will try to think of something hard. It's very easy. Bundles of axons in the peripheral nervous system are generally called nerves, right? Nerves, right? Don't make this hard. So the same stuff in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system have different names. These, you know, when you're out in the peripheral nervous system, all the nerves seem to be running very distinctly. You know, we've seen enough nerves now in the cat that we understand that. You can't often distinguish tracks within the central nervous system because all the white matter tends to just be bundled together so much that if you're really careful and you do some careful dissection in the brain, you can actually find some little bundles that are running from one location to another. But it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to do. <clears throat> Let's look at the layout of white matter and gray matter then in both the spinal cord and in the brain. Okay? So here we are. Here's the spinal cord cross section. Here's a frontal section right, through your cerebrum. Helps to know what a frontal section might look like. And you see gray matter and white matter in both pictures, don't you? And see how the words have been used. Like here, the cortex, this is the cerebral cortex. And remember the, si the gyri and sulci? Now that cortex folds itself down in and out over the surface of the brain. Here are the basal nuclei right here. But see all the white matter in here? This is all tracts of white matter all the way through here. If you're in the spinal cord, the tracts of white matter are all here, and the gray matter is here. Isn't that kind of interesting that the spinal cord and the brain are built oppositely? Gray matter primarily on the outside here, white matter down deep. Here, white matter primarily on the outside, gray matter down deep. If you think of the two functions, though, it slightly makes sense. This is all about thinking, isn't it? Gray matter is here, and the white matter is just helping different thinking areas talk to one another. Here, the primary action of the spinal cord is really transmitting data from the brain down to various parts of the body. So there's a lot more transmission matter here, white matter here, than gray. There is some gray here because the spinal cord is going to be responsible for some, quote, thinking activities. Not complex thinking of activities, but very simple activities. We typically think of the spinal cord as mediating reflexes. You know what a reflex is, right? You touch something hot, you pull your fingers back, right? You, you have some processing here because you don't want to wait for something damaging to you to reach your brain, figure out what it is, and then try and help yourself, right? You want to withdraw yourself from that danger before you're even thinking about it. So there, there's some gray matter here, and we'll look at that a little more extensively in a little bit. But so you can see how this plays out. This is one of the most important concepts that you understand what is going on in gray matter and white matter. And when you look at the, the central nervous system from the inside, you can kind of see, oh, I can imagine what's going on where. One of the lectures that you need to do on your own is called the brain areas. This is a, a little bit of homework for you. I want to make sure you get to that. We've given you the background for that in our study of the cerebrum. And we will finish up on Friday our study of the cerebrum. Um, but along with that, you really, really want to understand what's going on. Um, 
in this gray matter. And so this, what we're going to do is start delineating. Some of this gray matter is doing this. Some of this gray matter is doing that. So this gray matter over here is doing this. Da 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 da. Correct. There's cell bodies and dendrites. Um, if you go back to that, if you went back to that picture we had before, the axons go over, and the end of the axon then is in contact with the dendrites of the next. So this gray matter is doing some decision making, sending its response to this gray matter. This is receiving it processing it in some other way, and then sending its data on to some other place. It's receiving and processing, and then sending its response to some other gray matter. So a lot of this is just tons of different gray matter areas talking to each other to figure something out. You know, if you want to remember where you parked your car, Right, you have to know what your car looks like. So somewhere in your gray matter is a record of what your car looks like. Somewhere there's a general layout in your mind of what the parking lot looks like. And maybe some, some key things like a light pole or some trees or whatever. And your brain has to kind of, these, these different, your sights and your memory and all of these things have to be linked together and talk to each other. All these little bits of gray matter have to talk to each other to bring this coherent picture together of where you are and what your car looks like. And then it's got to make some little temporary memory. This is about where my car is. But how do, how do a bunch of neurons do that? What kind of signals are they sending to one another? How can something be recorded in a cell temporarily and then just kind of go away when it's not important anymore? Heather. No. Smarter people have more connections between neurons. See, it's all those little spots where the neurons come together, where the, the axons connect to the dendrites. It's all those kind of, every time you learn something, there are more connections within your brain. The person that knows a little only has a little bit to use to learn something more. The more and more a person knows, the more and more they can know. Right? The more you understand. The world gets bigger and bigger and bigger the more you know. The less you know, the smaller and smaller and smaller your world is. But it's, we, we all have about the same number of brain cells, but it's how are they connected. The more connecting links you make, from axons to dendrites, from cells to cells to cells, the more knowledge you store. We all, we all have this potential. It's just, do you use it or not? It's like, how does somebody get strong? By sitting on the couch? Right? This is just, this is a principle of the universe. This is a principle of life. Use it or lose it. Practice it, work it, exercise it, or it goes away. Doesn't matter if it's muscles or your brain. Right? Math problems are good for people. You know, pe why, why do I have to study this algebra? I'm never going to use it. Well, it's doing one thing. It's like going to the weight room and lifting weights. It's making your brain work to figure something out. You've built more connections. You're going to run up against something in the real world that isn't math, but is modeled in the same thinking process that it takes to solve an algebraic problem. Your brain is ready to work in that way because it's figured this thing out, because it's applied itself, because it's done something harder than it normally does. Bones get stronger when you put pressure and weight and stress on them. When you're active, your bones get stronger, your muscles get stronger. Well, your nervous system makes more connections the more you challenge it. So, gray matter and white matter and their interactions and the number of connections that are made between cells is what results in you knowing things. Okay? 
<clears throat> let's talk just a, bit, a little bit about this general process of getting data in and actions out. The gray matter, we're going to use the spinal cord because it's just a very, very simple sort of circuit system here. Our, our things like figuring out a math problem are much more complicated than what we're going to talk about here. But at least this will give you just sort of the basic idea of how sensory processing and motor neurons interact. <clears throat> In the gray matter here, we have a posterior horn, a lateral horn, and an anterior horn of gray matter. Right? You should be able to identify those. Different things are happening in each of those various areas. But I think you can guess by now, you're, you're likely to see this picture on an exam. I can't guarantee it, but it's one that I use on a regular basis. You should be able to identify like rootlets and dorsal ramus and ventral ramus and all the rest of this. The white matter here, <clears throat> if you were using your x-ray vision here and looking down into this, what you would see is tons and tons of axons, wouldn't you? Right? And those axons would be running up and down through the spinal cord, carrying messages up to the brain or down to the muscles. Right? And we've even got to a place where we've actually mapped out these nerve tracks. Okay? Each little circle you see here is a nerve track running through the spinal cord. Some of these are identified as ascending nerve tracks, and some of these are descending nerve tracks. Now, Nerve, not in the fact that these are actual nerves, because this is in the central nervous system. These are tracks. But ascending versus descending. This is like the two lanes on the freeway. Some of the traffic is going up, and some of the traffic is coming down. And they're coming in separate locations. Ascending tracks, the blue ones here, are what kind of information? Sensory or motor? You can figure this out. Sensory or motor? I got some sensory votes here. Okay? Traffic that's going to my brain must be sensory, right? Right. It's the data from my skin is traveling. All of the little nerve, the sensory nerve endings in my skin are all coming together in the spinal nerves. That's entering into the spinal cord. And all of that data, all those axons are running up through the spinal cord, carrying sensory information to my brain so I know what's happening on the surface of my skin. Likewise, then, descending nerve tracks must be motor, right? Taking thoughts and impulses and intentions to act down through these packets and connecting those out to the muscles of my body and causing me to coordinate the muscular activities of my body. Now, if we wanted to be an advanced ANP class, I could have you learn the names of each one of these because every one of those little packets, every one of those nerve tracks actually has a name because it's coming from a certain place and it's going to a certain place. It's kind of like those joints where you name the joint for the two bones that come together. These nerve tracks are typically named for where they're coming from and where they're going to. But if we want to be advanced about this, you could be learning the names of all of these. So as hard as this class is, you've got to be thankful once in a while that I'm not throwing the book at you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, but you should, as a student of anatomy, be aware that there are distinct tracks of axons running through the spinal cord that are either sensory or motor, ascending or descending. The other thing to note here is that most of the sensory tracks are in one area where most of the motor tracks are in the other area, right? This back here is dorsal. And over here on this side is ventral. You can see this anterior median sulcus. Most of the motor track, not all, but most of the motor traffic is anterior. And most of the sensory traffic is lateral or posterior. 
So those are some basic facts that you should take from this. Okay? So you don't have to learn all of those, but you, you want to have a picture in your mind and a basic layout of that. Now let's... Let me just put in these terms for those basic areas. Right? <clears throat> okay, so now what we want to do is actually look at the neurons and how they are sort of laid out within all of this gray matter and white matter. Um, previously, we talked about the fact that there were roots coming out of the gray matter here, rootlets that form these two roots, which then form the spinal nerve. And we said the spinal nerve has axons, both sensory and motor, traffic going both ways in any typical spinal nerve. Um, remember that the spinal nerves then branch into these rami as they go out. All of these would be bidirectional too. You would have axons going in both directions. But back in here, when you get inside, the sensory and motor traffic tends to be in one of two directions. This dorsal root here that we named earlier is carrying the sensory traffic. So, although you've got two-way streets out here, lanes going in both directions, as you get in near the big city, right, you get a lot of one-way streets. And the dorsal root is a one-way street into the spinal cord, bringing sensory information in. And the ventral root is the one carrying most of the motor information. Now again, there are some slight exceptions to this, but on the whole, you want to see it in this direction, that the sensory traffic is coming in the dorsal root and the motor traffic is coming out below. So traffic is going to come into this gray matter. Decisions are going to be made about that information. Any motor activity that needs to take place, something from the brain comes down and it's going to go out through this ventral route. So I, I, I think of this just like being in the big city. If you go down to LA and you get right in downtown, all the streets are one-way streets. All right? It's more efficient when you've got that much traffic in a very small area. It's much, much more efficient to go one way. So this is the general flow of nerve impulses from the body into the spinal cord or out. Now the, those various ascending and descending pathways out here at some point come into the gray matter and then funnel themselves out through spinal nerves. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about gray matter in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, gray matter in the peripheral nervous system is called a ganglion. Uh, you remember from our previous pictures, 99% of all the gray matter in the nervous system is in the central nervous system. But there is a small amount of it. Remember, it's going to be cell bodies, dendrites, those kinds of things. Um, there's a good example here of a ganglion right here in the dorsal root. In fact, we call it the dorsal root ganglion. If you compare the dorsal root and the ventral root, the dorsal root is large and swollen because it contains a whole bunch of cell bodies. These are not in the central nervous system because you've got to be in the brain or spinal cord. This is out. This is where the peripheral nervous system starts, the moment you come out of the spinal cord. So there's a, there's a whole load of gray matter right there, and it's this little sort of lump, we call it a ganglion. This is the best way when you're looking at a picture to be able to tell the ventral root from the dorsal root, isn't it? If I turn this picture upside down and backwards, you should still be able to pick out the dorsal root. It's going to be the one that has a ganglion in it, doesn't it? Right? So what we want to do next, though, is kind of take some of the neurons that we've talked about and kind of let's play in and see what this all looks like. Do you remember this neuron from our talk last week? I showed you three different kinds of neurons. 
right? You remember this one? Oh, good. Thank you, Janae. Okay. Unipolar neuron. Remember, this was interesting because it really didn't have dendrites. If you don't have dendrites, you don't, you're typically not bringing data into the cell body, so you're not making any decisions. This is really a cell body keeping a whole axon alive. An axon is not going to make any decisions. It's just going to take whatever data it has here and pass it on to the next place. No processing, no interpretation, no changing. Whatever's here gets through to over there. It's kind of like just a plain bare wire in electricity. Whatever comes in this end of the wire comes out that end of the wire. So the cell body is kind of off to the side here, just keeping this thing alive. But the general flow of information is here, and it's not interpreted. This is characteristic of sensory information. We said unipolar neurons are your typical sensory neurons. Okay. What kind of neuron was this? Unipolar was that one. This one was... Starts with an M. Yeah, multipolar. Remember, there was multipolar, bipolar, and unipolar. These multipolar neurons are typical of motor information, where it takes input, a lot of coordinating input, and decides whether to fire or whether to make that muscle work. So these are decision makers. If you're in the central nervous system, this is what we're talking about. Right? The cell body is within the gray matter here. And the axon then reaches out the ventral rootlets, out the ventral root, and then becomes part of the spinal nerve. When we were talking about a man getting his arms chopped off, right? The desire to move his fingers was coming down from the brain, down from some of these motor areas here, and routing itself into the gray matter where the cells were with the axons leading out to the muscles in his arms. Right? When that axon was chopped off, you could send all the signals from the brain down to here you want, but if you can't get the link to the muscle, it's not going to work. So this is typical of motor neurons having their cell bodies in gray matter here, and then the axons going out. Uh, to some point in the human body. And then here's the sensory neuron, isn't it? Right? That's why we have this ganglion here. This is raw sensory data. My skin isn't going to figure out what it's doing. All my skin is going to do is send those electrical impulses from the receptors up to my brain. My brain is going to figure out what's going on. Right? My brain is going to interpret that. So all I want to do is get the raw stimuli, the raw sensory data, just straight here into the spinal cord so the spinal cord can then figure out where we need to send this to so it can be interpreted. And that's why this is typically a unipolar neuron. Just get it in. The cell bodies are outside the central nervous system. So this is what we would call a ganglion. Right? This is where we would find those satellite cells. Remember the glial cells called satellite cells that sort of insulate and protect and create a little mini environment for the cells, for the neurons here. Because all neurons have to live within a special chemical environment. We have satellite cells to do that, and we have Schwann cells to insulate the axons. Here's a picture from your textbook. All textbooks have a picture something like this. Um, this is a unipolar neuron. A little more diagrammatic because we got the entire picture here now, don't we? Right? Here's the fingertip feeling something. That sensory data transmitted directly into the posterior horn of the gray matter here. Here's the little cell body living up here in the dorsal root. Right? And all that's doing is keeping this wire alive so the data gets effectively from there to there. That then is going to send 
data in the axons from here are going to go up the spinal cord and arrive in one part of the brain that interprets what goes on in my skin. And this happens to be the parietal lobe. That brain areas lecture is going to help you divide up the cerebrum and know where certain activities, sensory or motor, are occurring within the brain. I've just given you a little bit of a picture. This, this area in blue right here is the area that interprets everything that goes on with your skin. All the axons from here are going to route their data to this point in your brain. None of the other areas. We can do the same thing with motor neurons. Here in your brain, there's another lobe here called the frontal lobe, which is where all of your action is thought of. Everything you want to do with your human body is there. Um, the motor tracks, right, the descending tracks here in the anterior part of the spinal cord are going to come down here, connect into the anterior horn of the gray matter, and here's that multipolar motor neuron carrying its signal right out to the muscle. This is how the neurons and the tissues and all of this plays out. Let's put all of it together into what's called a reflex pathway. When you go to the doctor and you sit on the table and he taps your knee and you have a little jerk at it, what's he testing? Is he testing your bones? Is he testing your joints? What's he testing? Your reflexes, he's testing the health of your spinal cord. He's saying, is your spinal cord working normally? Because the reflex happens up in the spinal cord, not out here. All that happens here is sensory data from here travels through into the spinal cord. The spinal cord's got to figure out what it means. And if it's working properly, it's going to send a reflex. When he taps various parts of you to see if there's a reflex, he's basically trying to find out if your spinal cord is healthy. <clears throat> All right, our example here is somebody stepped on a tack. Youchy, right? Pain. If you step on it hard enough, extreme pain is coming up through this sensory neuron into the posterior part of the spinal cord, this posterior horn. There are connections here that are going to send that data straight to the brain so you know what's going on. But if the pain is strong enough, <clears throat> there's an interneuron here. It's not sensory, it's not motor, it's doing something in between. That's what we mean when we say an interneuron. It's not focused on sensory or motor. But this one has a very high pain threshold. So if something like I'm just standing on the ground, comes through. There isn't enough data from that to stimulate this little neuron. It's an excitatory neuron. Get me excited and I'll fire. Okay? So I get some pain going here, right? And that causes this thing to fire. And this then is, direct, is connected directly to some muscles that are going to contract my leg and pull it out of the way. That happens. This is coming out here while this message is going up to my brain. I'm typically removing myself from the danger before I even know what's going on. You've done this before. You've st touched something hot and you're pulling your hand. Ooh, that was hot, right? But you've already saved yourself before you realized it. And that's because you've got these these pathways, they're not going to let just normal, ordinary data cause you to jerk all the time. These are going to be set. These are going to be programmed so they'll only fire it with extreme pain. But, but here's a simple little circuit, right, we call a reflex, okay, that is part of the big picture of the nervous system. Um, if I'm thinking of 2 plus 2 is 4, something complex, way more complex than this, but there still has to be some data coming in. I've got to learn what 2 is in the first place. I've got to learn what 4 is. I've got to learn my numbers. Then I've somehow got to get the concept of putting things together, and that's taking place through data coming in and a thinking process that puts that all together. Okay? Interneurons are really the key to most of the complex 
activity within you and me. And this is way too complex for you and I to really study. Okay? The sensory neurons, the motor neurons, and basically the thought of inner neurons is all good and helpful and understandable. Here. Just very quickly, like these excitatory neurons here, um, if you look in deeply into the central nervous system where you're, you're feeling things and you're adding numbers together and you're learning how to write and you're learning vocabulary and all sorts of things like that, there's a whole host of inner neurons. Imagine if you had to learn the names of all of these. Here's a pyramidal cell. Here's a cell of the thalamic, thalamic nucleus. Here's the spindle-shaped cells, granule cells. Uh, interior olivary nucleus neuron, ovoid cell, large reticular formation, Purkinje cell, right? Small uh, reticular formation cell, neuron from a, the putamen of the lentiform nucleus. And you've got all these different kinds of neurons with all these way complex connections that are going to result in the complex thinking that you do. Stacked together, organized together, so that their interactions are going to turn out to be all the stuff that you're thinking and doing and feeling. Right? This is, this is way too much for us to really study and think about. But you do want to have this basic, if you've got this basic layout, What's going on in the brain when I see gray matter, when I see white matter? I'm going to be focusing on the gray matter areas as areas where I do my thinking. I need to go a little bit longer here. I'm going to finish this up. If you need to go, you can go, but I need to finish this up so I've got a recording of this. You can catch it online later. Um, there are a couple of other little bits of terminology that we need to use here. Okay? When we talk about white matter in the nervous system, about these tracks, there are typically three kinds of tracks that occur within the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, the nerves here are pretty straightforward. The nerves all get named as they come out of the spinal cord. But deep within the brain, there are typically three types of tracks, and we should know the names of these. Commissural tracks are tracks that connect from the right side to the left side of various structures within the brain, within the central nervous system, I should say, spinal cord or brain. I've already mentioned to you that the, almost the entire nervous system is deeply divided into two hemispheres into two halves. It's almost as if I had two nervous systems that coordinate with one another, but two distinct nervous systems. A commissure, whenever you see something called a commissure, it's meaning that it is a commissural tract. When you hear the word tract, you always think axons, white matter. So a commissure like here would be connecting things from right to left. Um, this picture sort of illustrates the three different types of commissural fibers. Um, notice here, this is pointing to a commissural fiber, blue in color. Anybody think, can you think of what this is down here at the bottom of the longitudinal fissure of the cerebrum? You did study this. I think everybody got to this last Friday. No, cerebellum is, remember, down and behind here. I'm looking at the cerebrum. I remember that there's this deep division so that the cerebrum is really two separate hemispheres except for one little thing that you had to cut. That If you were going to separate them, you'd have to cut something, but it was just a little comma-shaped piece. Remember that? Ah, good. Several of you remember. The corpus callosum. Right? The corpus callosum is white matter. Now I know what it is. There's no thinking going on in the corpus callosum. It's simply tons and tons of axons connecting gray matter on the right 
to commit gray matter on the left. So things that are going on on the right side of my brain are communicated and understood by things on my left. Okay? Another commissural track here is there's a little connecting link through the third ventricle connecting the right side of the diencephalon to the left. So again, the two sides can talk to each other. So commissural tracks connect the, nervous, the central nervous system from right to left. Okay, association tracks are a second one. These are pretty straightforward. Association tracks associate gray matter within the same hemisphere. Okay, within the same hemisphere. So if gray matter in one lobe here needs to talk to gray matter in another part of the lobe, if I'm going to remember something and I've got to link what it looks like to what it sounds like, there are going to be tracks that are carrying and coordinating what I hear with what I see. Some of these are little short fibers that go just coordinate close areas of gray matter. Some of these are long and they're going to connect like the front of my brain to the back of my brain. The tracks are going to run lengthwise through. Uh, a good example of that is when I want to say something, I formulate what I want to say right here in the posterior part of my cerebrum. But to get it out my mouth, I've got, to trans I've got to transfer that information up here to the movement part of my brain that's actually going to move my lips, tongue, you know, vocal cords, all of that, to get it out my mouth. Some people have strokes where they know what they want to say but they can't say it. They can't get it out their mouth because the stroke was up in this area and they can't coordinate the elements to make sounds. Other people have strokes back here and that's a very, very tough one because they can't even think of what they want to say. They can't put the words together either in order or they can't think of the words that go. They can see objects and they know what that object is but they can't come up with a word for it. So. One time I was in a bike accident. Mm hmm. I hit my head. Yep. I, when I woke up from being unconscious, I couldn't describe anything. I couldn't think of the names. Yeah. Damage. You probably, when you went down, you probably hit this side of your head. And temporarily there was maybe some swelling or something there that. Yeah, exactly. So association fibers connect within the same hemisphere one area to another. They don't cross. That's commissural tracks. The third one then, so that's association within a hemisphere. The third one is projection tracks. Now these are tracks from areas of gray matter. They're going to carry their signals in or out of the central nervous system. So we have some axons that are going in or out. These are projection tracks. The ones that you see here are motor tracks. They're in black, aren't they? These motor tracks are coming from areas of the cerebrum that are intending to move muscles, and these connecting links go straight out down the spinal cord and connect out to the muscles of the body. So these are traveling down through the brain stem, down through the spinal cord. We call these projection tracks. One very interesting thing in this picture, have you ever heard that the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body? Or the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body? Yes? Right? My wife's left-handed. She always tells me she's the one in her right mind. Right? Well, there's actually a physical basis for that, isn't there? Look right here at the bottom of this picture. You can see the two projection tracks literally crossing over, physically crossing over. All the data from this right side of my brain comes down and crosses over in the brain stem and then travels down the opposite side of the spinal cord to work all the muscles on that side of the body. You can physically see it's not some magic or some... Wow, that, how did that happen? The wiring literally crosses over to travel to the other side. Why is that? 
I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows. It's just one of those mysteries. Why do I have two nervous systems? And then why does one nervous system control the opposite side of my body? There must be some sort of advantage to that, but nobody's really come up with it yet. So, projection tracks are ones that are leading down to the peripheral nervous system, connecting it to the peripheral nervous system. Okay? So, if you were doing our simple diagram here, you'd say commissural association tracks are here within the central nervous system, and projection tracks are the ones that are going to be connected out to the body. All right? These would ultimately turn into nerves out here, but projection tracks would be the things coming from gray matter inside going out. And I don't know why I have this twice. Let's finish up with a simple exercise here. Can you do this one? <clears throat> gray matter, white matter, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. What's the language here? You're not going to be able to answer a question or do anything else with understanding this if you don't have some basic terminology here. If I'm describing, if I'm using words that describe gray matter in the central nervous system, what are those words that you see pop up? Okay, I heard cortex, that's correct. Nuclei, and in the spinal cord? Somebody said horns, right. Cortex, nuclei, and horns, those are those terminologies that we hear related to gray matter. Okay? In the peripheral nervous system, right? Ganglion, singular, ganglia, plural, is a description of gray matter out in the peripheral nervous system somewhere. We have some pretty complex ganglia in our abdominal cavity related to our digestive system. Uh, some people even say we have sort of a digestive brain down here. There's enough little ganglia down in there that coordinate some of the actions down there that um, these play a role in our health and what's going on. How about white matter? In the central nervous system, all white matter is referred to as tracks, right? And all white matter out in the peripheral nervous system is referred to as nerves, right? Good. Good, good, good. So... Just a quick summary of everything here. Think about gray matter and white matter, where it is, what it does, those kinds of things. We've laid out some simple illustrations of that. <clears throat> Nerve impulses, how do they get in and out of the spinal cord? How are the roots and the rootlets and the spinal nerves all structured? Inner neurons, we, are, we can't go deep into the structure of inner neurons. They're way too complex for us. But just to understand that most of my thinking and processing is in those inner neurons. And then make sure you're thinking about these tracks of white matter, commissural tracks, association tracks, and um, projection tracks. Okay? I can try. But I'm going to stop this right now so that I can wrap this up, and then I will. Okay? So I hope that does it for you. should be able to see this online a couple of days, maybe just a day if you want to review it.